thanks everybody for coming. We're going to go ahead and dive right in. I will give, uh, we've got some new folks in the room, so I will give you the really short version of my background. So, and why you're here, and theoretically why you're listening to me. Um, I started out as a retail financial advisor. There are a number of folks in the room who resemble that remark. I started, uh, when I got back from training after passing my Series 7 and all my licensing exams, my branch manager said, I got a book for you where all of your clients are going to come from for your entire career. I said, oh man, I'm young, I'm dumb, I'm 22, I'm going to get a Ferrari, I'm going to get big speakers for my stereo, this is gonna be, I'm going to be rich, it's going to be great, give me the book. And he reached behind the desk and handed me the yellow pages, literally the phone book. And he said, they're all in there, Tiger, go get them. And I didn't know any better, so I made 300 cold calls a day, interrupting strangers during every meal time you can imagine, trying to get them to give me money to invest. And if you've ever tried that, you know it's very frustrating, pain, time consuming, and really sucks. That's a technical marketing term that it sucks. Um, so I didn't know any better. I banged my head against the wall for a couple of years until in my spare time, I am a professional magician. Had the good fortune to see a full page ad in a magician's trade journal. Yes, magicians have a bunch of different trade journals. And the ad was for a marketing course. I didn't have any money at the time, so I got my parents to buy it for me as my birthday present for that year, because they were still doing birthdays even though I was in my 20s. And bought the course from a guy by the name of Dave D, who some of you know. Yep, I see a couple of faces lighting up. So I bought the course, I implemented the course, and I became the busiest, most expensive magician in Western New York in less than 30 days. So it worked really well, really fast. So I used my critique certificate that came with my Dave D course to get a phone call with him and said, would this work in my real job as a financial planner? He said, yes. I said, where'd you learn it? He said, the two words that changed my life, Dan Kennedy. I start buying Dan Kennedy books, tapes, products, going to conferences. Um, things start getting a little bit better. Along the way, I had the good fortune to find me and Mary, my amazing wife, Rebecca. First year we were married, we got married, bought our first house had our first baby, and she quit her job to be a stay-at-home mom while well, I am still cold calling for a living. And so I said, Dan, what do I do? And he said, you're doing everything your industry taught you, which is completely wrong. Not your fault. Do this, 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 and this, and it'll totally change your life. Now, his presentation was a lot better than that. It took a whole day, and at the end of it, he said, you know, write me this six-figure check, and I'll change your life. Um, so I went home to my wonderful wife and said, I know you just, we just bought a house, you quit your job and you're a stay at home mom and I'm the sole breadwinner, but I need to go borrow more than our new mortgage to go hire this guy. And she said, no. And 30 days in a row, I kept asking the same question. I kept getting more intense in my passion for her to say yes. She kept getting more vehement and slightly profane in her answers of saying no and her rejection of me. And then on day 31, she finally said, you better pray this works. Um, so I w went to work with Dan in the first two years of working with Dan. He quadrupled my revenue and took me from AG Edwards had 6,700 advisors at the time. I was 6,699th when I started, meaning one up from the bottom. And in two years, I was in the top 30. And I was competing against guy, advisors who had been building client bases for 40 years and I hadn't even been alive half that long. So it worked really, really well. It got me written about in three trade journals, a couple best-selling books in the financial services industry, and my phone started ringing of advisors saying, how do I do what you did? And this was pre-internet. This is even before Al Gore started thinking about claiming he invented it. So it was all direct mail. And so I said, Dan, what do I do? And he said, you start another marketing, you start a marketing company and you do it for him. So that was 10 years ago, I started Market Domination LLC. It started out as me and one advisor that I was willing to take the risk that my stuff would work for him and his market. Um, it did, and now it's evolved 10 years later into an amazing company with an incredible team. And we've served, I think, over 2,193 clients literally around the planet. We have clients in every time zone imaginable, which makes it interesting on if I don't turn my phone off. Um, and along the way, I've written seven best-selling books on business and marketing. Number seven, Market Domination for Podcasting is on the shelves at Barnes & Noble now. And I'm the only person Dan has nominated three years in a row for his Marketer of the Year Award. And I'm the co-host of the Sharkpreneur podcast with Kevin Harrington from Shark Tank. The longer version of that is on YouTube. So what we're here to talk about today is the secrets to creating persuasive marketing that influences your clients and prospects and melts away sales resistance. Before we dive into that, um, I like to, one of the things you're going to learn is you should reward the behavior that you want to repeat. Reward the behavior you want to repeat. 
So last month you learned how to get 10,000 Facebook followers in less than a week and you learned some strategies for using sneaky ways on LinkedIn to get top level CEO, fortune, you know, A level decision makers to contact you. So we have a member in the room who actually did something. So I'm going to reward that behavior. They went out, they created the Facebook ads and I think they're at about 7,000 new followers um, since the last time we got there last time we met. So I would like to uh, award Tom Larson this awesome book, Be Like Amazon, Even a Lemonade Stand Can Do It, by another one of my marketing mem mentors, Roy Williams, who is the highest paid ad copywriter in the world. And I figured if a lemonade stand can be like Amazon, then an insurance agency absolutely can. So everybody give Tom a round of applause. <laughs> awesome job. Thank you. Enjoy. Thank you. All right. Now before we get into this, there's something I just, I have to share, this is totally unrelated. Um, it's one of the best marketing campaigns I've ever seen. And I happen to, it happened to come to me as a consumer and I have been obsessed, my staff will tell you, with every single step of their process. So I'm gonna share it with you and I'm certain that, I mean, I could teach days on it, but you will get some awesome marketing lessons from it. So I get, via direct mail, an envelope that looks like this, from never heard of this place, no idea what's coming. I open the direct mail and it is a 16 page sales letter, double sided, single space type, small print. And they say nobody reads anymore. 16 pages at the end of which this whole 16 pages is a sales letter to get me to opt in for something that's free. They took 16 pages to sell me something free and I cannot go online and opt in. I have to fax back the opt in form asking me to opt in for a 55 page sales letter. They don't call it that, it is the 55 page package. So I fax back, eager, the copy is absolutely brilliant. I try and go, I go online, it's all teaser copy. This does not tell you what it is. This is a sales letter for, I'm hoping it's a cult, I'm not sure yet, for a secret society made up of about 3,000 of the world's most successful influential people. They have been watching me, they've identified me as someone that they want to join the society who can contribute and learn the secrets of the universe of how to be rich, beautiful, thin, fit, romantic, everything. Wow, this sounds pretty incredible. It does, see, <laughs> Dean's in, he's already in. So I fax back to learn the secrets of the universe. I get their 55 page booklet, the greatest hidden secret of all time. Again, small print. The 55 page booklet is also a sales letter for a book, the manuscript containing the secrets of the universe. It's about 120 bucks for the book, which will cover their costs to get it to me. <laughs> Again, you have to fax back. I faxed back, breathlessly awaited. it. There's some other stuff in that package. There was a lift note. There's some other things that go with that. There was a letter. A Couple weeks later, I get the manuscript. I have covered the post-its because you're not in the cult and I'd have to kill you if I showed you. 1,200 pages. 1,200 pages, book. Right, I read the 16 pages and the 55 pages. 1,200 page book. The book is a novel. Now there's some absolutely brilliant marketing in this book. The book is a novel. It is about a third grade teacher who teaches her third graders this new philosophy of the secrets of the universe. And then it follows those third graders through the rest of their lives as they implement this philosophy and change the entire world. So it's an amazing story. Now. There is something in the principles of magic called a near miss. If you were trying to pretend to be psychic and I say, Dean, think of any playing card, Bill, think of any playing card, Paul, think of any playing card, and I just tell you what you're thinking of all three in a row and I get them perfectly right, A, you're really impressed, but your subconscious starts going, wait a minute, there's got to be a trick to that. How did he do that? It was too good. So there's a principle in magic called the near miss, which says I should get Dean's right, Bill's right, and miss Paul's by like one. So if he was thinking of the two of clubs, I should guess like the three of spades. All so close, but now I look human. 
So you don't immediately start trying to figure it out. So there's a principle of near miss that they used brilliantly. So in this book, there is something called variable data printing. We've all learned it called a mail merge. Like in Microsoft Word, when the letter says, dear Seth, as opposed to dear occupant or dear homeowner. It used to be really expensive to do because you literally had to paste in every single person's name, but then they came out with these things called computers, and it takes half a second for a letter. They did it in a book. I can't imagine what the costs are, but they did variable data printing with a near miss. So what that means is the third grade teacher is teaching in Cheektowaga. Not Williamsville, where my address is, because it'd be too obvious. I'd, everybody would start picking up on that, not just marketing people. They did it in Cheektowaga. The elementary school where she teaches actually exists. The, the stories written about her controversial teaching methods run in the Buffalo News. It's all in the book. And I'm sitting here going, how many books are they selling at one time that they can afford to mail merge a 1,200 page book? Now again, I've Googled, I've searched on every place I can find online, there's nothing. They're purposely not online at all. I'm guessing, they seem pretty, pretty smart. What I was able to find is the book is registered with the Library of Congress, and I was able to find out that they've sold over 250,000 copies. At 120 bucks a book, you do the math, it sure beats working for a living. So if you didn't know that the Library of Congress will tell you how many books somebody sold, turns out they will. So, interesting. So they've sold millions of dollars of $120 books. After the book, I get the next sales letter. The next sales letter says, hey, congratulate. Smaller, smaller print. It keeps getting smaller. Pretty soon I'm going to need a magnifying glass. It's now time to decode the manuscript for which I have to buy the next book, which I sent in my credit card right away. Interesting thing was I got it on, let's say, a Monday. The deadline to fax back was Tuesday. They gave me 24 hours to buy the second book or I'm out. So they are conditioning my behavior really, really well. So I am now breathlessly awaiting book number two, where I will learn what this was trying to, what just subtly taught me through the story. And then it has told me that after book one, there's three more. So there's book two, three, and four. I have to read them all. And then I'm eligible to attend a meeting in person and meet some of these luminaries that are in this amazing secret society. So I, have all, I, I, I thought about faxing back a letter that says, just send me the Kool-Aid, I'll drink it. Um, but I wasn't sure how that would, if they didn't have a sense of humor, it wouldn't work very well. Um, if I suddenly disappear and give all my money to some weird organization, it's because I joined their cult. But we think people don't read. We think they have nine second attention spans. We think you can't charge $120 for a book and no one's going to read 1,200 pages and you can't just use direct mail anymore. Apparently you can. So it made me rethink what is possible, not in terms of the secrets of the universe, but in terms of what you can get away with and what people will buy from a marketing perspective. Because I would get it if only 250,000, if they sold, I get the marketing part, but they've sold 250,000 of these, I'm guessing mostly to consumers. All right. Questions on that? I just had to share. I hope that's so you're out. Telling all the stuff is coming in regular mail. Regular mail. So it's like in between all the stuff is like 10 days? At least. <laughs> Sometimes, because they got, remember, it's 1,200 pages. They got to give you time to read the book. Did you read the whole book? I read the whole book. It's funny, this became an ongoing thing in my family of the kids asking every day, Daddy, how far are you? I took it, we recently, we went to Virginia for Thanksgiving to see my in laws and my brother, and I think I drove the first six hour, five hours, Rebecca drove the last three, and the kids are like, are you done yet, Daddy? Are you done yet, Daddy? I mean, I really, I'd read really fast, and this still took me a long time. I mean, it was a few weeks before I got it done. How, the, brave, how brave were they on the uh, next slide in the decoder? How I'm sorry? Brave, how brave were they on their pricing on the decoder? Here's what, that's a great question. Here's what really surprised me. The next book is cheaper. Downsell. It was a downsell, even though I didn't say no. The next book is cheaper. I would have gone up. 
I would have thought the first book should be 120. Now I've seen how good it is. The next book should be multiples of that. Instead, they drop to 90 bucks. I'm guessing they're really smart and they've split tested a million different ways. And I can't <coughs> wait to meet the people in person at a secret meeting <laughs> where, I, where I will learn their handshake. Well, because maybe people don't read that fast. So let's say you didn't get through it all. Yeah. So you don't know the value of the next one until you get through it. Mm -hmm. So they're like, oh, shoot, I didn't read it. I'll just, I'll just pay for the next one. Yeah. That is an excellent point. It's interesting to see where the meeting is. Yes. And they may not be luminaries. They may just be people who bought the thing. Well, they're certainly good at marketing. The person, yes, whoever created it is absolutely brilliant. It does. All right, awesome. So now we're going to go into what you actually came to learn. The I'm, not sure the, I'm not sure the clicker's on, by the way. You're not sure the clicker's on. OK, it is on now. OK, the secrets to creating persuasive marketing that influences client and clients and prospects. So this comes from my work with a couple different people. Um, who are household names, at least in the marketing industry. This is Robert, Robert Cialdini, who wrote two of the most important marketing books, presumably ever, two of my favorite top 10. If you don't have them, I highly suggest them because I can't cover everything. Um, the Psychology of Persuasion, otherwise known as Influence. Persuasion, his new book, A Revolutionary Way to Influence and Persuade. And Jordan Belfort from The Wolf of Wall Street. Because whatever, it's funny, I've had the good fortune to actually get to talk to Jordan and hired him and did work with him and some of which I'm going to teach you today. And how many of you have seen the movie Wolf of Wall Street? Almost everybody. Okay. So first thing he said is, interesting thing is, the movie is tame. Which is surprising considering if you've seen the movie. And he said, you wouldn't believe how much we had to cut out of what really happened to actually get them to make it as a movie. I'm like, didn't Scorsese direct? Yeah, he made us cut a whole lot. I'm like, wow, that's pretty bad if Martin Scorsese from like Goodfellas is making you cut things from a movie that weren't somebody stabbing somebody in the trunk of a car repeatedly. Um, however, the reason why I did some work with him is because when he was the Wolf of Wall Street, he did take a enormous group of untalented, ignorant young people and turn them into absolutely incredibly productive multi-million dollar salespeople. And I said, if you can take them and make them all amazing salespeople, you figured something out. So after getting out of prison, his reform is now he is a sales trainer. So he is teaching people how to do what he did. But the condition is you have to use it for good. You know, you can't go steal from people or rip them off like we did. I've got religion now. I'm, you know, no longer on drugs and I did a number of years in prison. So. We're, you have to use it. I won't make you raise your hand and swear that you'll use this for ethical purposes or something, but I'll trust you. Okay, so things from my work with Robert. There are six principles of influence, and you're gonna, if you don't know these already, you should certainly write them down. I'll slide it. Uh, number one is consistency. So these are things you're gonna want, we're gonna talk about how to use in your marketing. People have a need to be consistent with something they have already done. Um, so this is, they did an incredible amount of psychological studies. So what they found is, let me ask you, let's say that you were having, making an appointment with a potential client. We all, most of us all schedule meetings with people. Which one works better? We'll mark you on the list as coming then. We'll mark you on the list as coming then, okay? It's the part where it's interactive and you guess. The first, the first one. Well, it helps if you, have a if you don't have typos. But, um, everyone says, well, Mark, you on the list is coming then. Interesting. What they found was if you use the OK, it increases your show up rate 17.4%. Because like A, you asked them, and B, they said yes. They then have to remain consistent with the fact that they said yes. If they don't show, they feel bad because they're inconsistent. So a lot of these are you just add one word, and it makes a huge difference. Mm -hmm. well, you're the, question. the word and the question, yes. I wouldn't say, we'll mark you on the list, it's coming then, okay. Intonate, as you're going to learn when we do scripts, intonation and inflection are incredibly important and make a huge difference in between success and failure. When we get to the scripts part, you're going to see a script that we wrote for a financial advisor. And the funny thing was we hadn't done their training yet on how to use the words, the intonation and inflection part, and the secretary saw the list, the script sitting on the printer, 
went over there, picked it up, was like, oh, what's this? Oh, huh, this looks interesting, and started calling prospects. So we love her because she's ambitious. And then I got a phone call shortly thereafter going, oh my God, this really works. I'm like, wait a minute, you're calling people? We haven't even trained you yet. I know, I just couldn't wait. And it worked. I said, we'll make it even better. Okay, so another thing they found is when you go to the dentist, you fill out, the secretary hands you your little appointment card of when your next appointment is, that little business card with the date and time on it. What they found is if they made the patient fill the card out, it increased their show up rates 18%. And they did this in an entire country and, serve, and tracked all the responses and it generated several hundred million dollars more in medical revenue because the patient filled out the card. Craig, when voters were shown an American flag before they took an online survey, eight months later, the amount of them who showed up to vote went up 22%. Because subtly seeing the American flag on the website made them feel more patriotic. And they wanted to remain consistent with that, and thus a lot more of them voted. They did a study with a furniture store and the furniture website, and what they found is when they were trying to sell softer, more comfier furniture, if they made the background of the website a blue sky with clouds on it, they sold a lot more furniture. When it was a darker, supposedly more higher end, more professional color, the softer furniture sales dropped and people bought more functional furniture. Things you would never think to test. So they set up a, this was on a, a beach in New York during, a, during the summer and Kristen would be the person who was the regular person and she would just be sitting on the beach working on her tan. And they had someone come who was an actor, Kristen doesn't know she's an actor, Someone comes, they set up their stuff, they set up their radio, they set up their umbrella, they're all set up next to her. A few minutes later, they walk away from their stuff. Guy runs up, grabs the boombox, and runs away. Theft, right in front of Kristen, or we'll use Dean. 20% of the time, Dean got up and went after the guy, just being a good Samaritan. What they found was when the actor said, hey, Dean, can you watch my stuff? How many more people intervened? 50%? 50%? 19 out of 20. Almost every single person not only ran after the thief, but physically tried to tackle them or take them down. Because they were remaining consistent, because Dean said, yeah, I'll watch your stuff. Now he's got to watch the stuff. Does that make sense? What can we ask them to do that they will commit to that ends up resulting in them buying what we're selling? We're going to get to that. Okay, next principle is reciprocity. All right, so one thing you're gonna find, and this is a setup, at black and blue, at the end of the dinner or the meal, if you're the person paying the check, they will bring little truffles. Little chocolate truffles that will go on the check. We did an experiment, and it used to be you got one truffle. Then they upped it to two truffles. What we did with some very smart staff members was we had them give you one truffle, leave, come back, and bring you the second one. And we found that when you came back and offered them a second truffle, their tips went up by 21%. Same truffles, just one looks like it was more effort. Um, they did an uh, online survey about a new restaurant that was considering op being open. They were actually surveying the market before they built the, built the restaurant. Some of those, half of them were asked for advice about a new restaurant. The other half were asked for their opinion about a new restaurant. Which one do you think affects whether or not they actually go to the restaurant more? Advice. advice. Turns out those asked for advice reported a greater percentage of wanting to try the new restaurant and a much greater percentage actually showed up. Because it's advice is an opinion you have more buy-in if it's advice. Can I get your advice on something? Most people say, yeah, sure, because they want to help. There is a big trend right now in the home safety business, in the alarm business, where they will give you a free fire extinguisher and a home safety evaluation audit. 
and they have found when they do that, as opposed to just approaching you directly, there is a much higher percentage of people who will buy their overpriced fire alarm system. Because they felt that someone gave, wow, they gave me a fire extinguisher, they came out and looked at my home, they weren't perceiving it as someone was gonna come sell them something. I'm trying to figure out how we can give away a window. Because no one's gonna want just one window. Presumably, we give them one window, they're gonna buy the rest, because now all the rest of the windows are gonna look bad. There's gotta be some way we can tie it in. The next principle is social proof. We all want what everybody else has. When a dish on a restaurant menu is labeled as the most popular, magically its sales go up 20%. People buy what other people say is good. Unfortunately, they're not doing that. Your clients have to actually listen to you. And we'll see if they do it right with the truffles or if they just give me two. When told, a they did this in a school, when told a majority of their schoolmates try and eat fruit to be healthy versus talking about the nutritional benefits, which one do you think pulls better? Popularity. Popularity. 35% increase of fruit purchases in the cafeteria because they were told their classmates were eating it as opposed to telling them why they should eat it because of their health. Craig, in an Ohio election, there was a candidate who had no chance of winning, was like dead last in the polls, no percentage of the vote, no shot whatsoever. But he won the state attorney general race out of nowhere. How did he do it? All right, so we're talking about a different election. <laughs> different election, sorry. Not all, the other races. Not all the other races. Nope, he legally changed his last name to Brown, which in Ohio has a long, there's a long storied political history of families in, named Brown being their office holder. All he did was legally change his last name, and when they went to the voting booths, they were like, oh, don't we always vote for Brown, and pulled the lever. So, a unique strategy for sure. You got some votes. Yeah. Awesome. Next principle is authority. Mitch and Larry will remember this. Dan has a quote. He talks about people are, sti always, are still walking around with their umbilical cords in their hand looking for some place to plug into. You want to be the place they plug into. You want to be their authority. This is a very famous psychological study that Robert did. And so they did this test at a copy machine in a library, back when people went to public libraries and made copies. And they always did it when there was a line of people. And they had a woman run up to the front of the line and say, excuse me, I have five pages. May I use the Xerox machine? How many people let her in? 60%. 60% said yes. But it's gonna get better because the next time they said, excuse me, may I, have five, I have page, may I use the Xerox machine because I'm in a rush? How many more? 94% said yes. You're a terrible person. We're all too right. Right, see, that's what I would think. So it up 34%, almost up by half. All she did was add, because I'm in a rush. Now here's the interesting part. What if you get rid of the rush? Do you think it changes it? What if you said, may I use a Xerox machine because I have to make some copies? No. Which makes no sense because everyone has to make some yeah. copies. And yet, 93% said yes. <laughs> so it, it almost doesn't matter what the reason is. The magic word is because. So one of the 11 most powerful words in marketing is because. There has to be a reason why. All right. There was a, they did an experiment where they had someone jaywalk on a busy street in Dallas, Texas. And he, first did, he was first wearing a work shirt and ripped jeans, and one or two people followed him across the street when he jaywalked. They had him do it again, he wore a suit and tie, 80% of the people followed him to jaywalk across the street. Because he looked like he knew what he was doing. The suit automatically conferred authority. 
You know what's funny is Dave Chappelle has a really funny, inappropriate stand-up comedy routine about this where he is criticizing women's choices of clothes and talking about how he got slapped for approaching a woman and her saying, well, just because I'm dressed this way doesn't mean blah, 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 blah. You can fill in the blanks. And so Dave, when he had his HBO show, did a funny experiment where he got dressed up as a police officer and would stand on the corner and wait for people to run up and say, officer, officer. And he'd say, oh, just because I'm dressed this way doesn't mean I'm actually a cop. You can be mad at Dave if you're offended by any of that. Uh, next principle is liking. They have to know you, like you, and trust you. So waitresses who mimic the verbal style of their customers doubled their tips. Not a direct copy. You can't go from a Buffalo accent to Texas just because someone there has a Texas accent. But if you mimic the speed at which they talk, the intonation at which they talk, their tips double because they were more like their customers. Waitresses who drew a smiley face and their name on the receipt up their tips 57%. So if you see a smiley face and a, with a little, with her name underneath it, next time you go out, hopefully it's because that's why she's doing it. She's not just a nice person. Hopefully she read the study and is increasing her tips. When asked what hair, what, at, at a salon, what hairstyle should I get? Hairdressers who said any hairstyle would look good on you increased their tips 37% as opposed to those who answered the question. Said, oh, you should have a bob. Any hairstyle would look good on you because they instantly bonded with their client. When told a bottle of wine was more expensive, drinkers reported liking it better and their brain scan showed increased activity in the pleasure centers of their brain. Same bottle of wine, just told it cost more. Magically, our brains process it as it must be better and react accordingly. So one of the easiest, biggest ways to impact some of what our clients do in terms of their volume of sales is the first thing we will most likely do is tell them to raise their prices. Because people perceive higher priced things are better. It may not always be true, but would I rather get a $149 quickie divorce or would I rather spend $5,000? I'm not getting divorced at all, but if I was, I'd go with the more expensive one. Thank you. At a Tupperware party, one of the games that all of the women play is called bingo, except you can't yell bingo when you get bingo. You have to yell Tupperware. And of course, you've got at least a half an hour per game at a Tupperware party. So every few minutes, someone is screaming out Tupperware in a very excited way, which is one of the many factors that magically translates into their sales. Next principle is scarcity. People want what they can't have. Once I was engaged to Rebecca, I don't know where these girls were before, but all of a sudden I started having women approach me more. I wasn't even the one wearing the ring. All of us, I said, six months ago, I was single. You wouldn't give me the time of day. Because you want what other people have and you want what you can't have. There is actually, if you've, there is a whole community of guys who call themselves pickup artists where they take classes, they go to conventions, they buy ebooks, products, DVD courses, tapes, all to learn how to do better with women. Um, there is the best book on the topic, which is a great marketing book, it's called The Game by Neil Strauss. If you haven't read it, I highly suggest it. It will both fascinate and disturb you. Um, however, one of the things that they have taught some of their um, more aggressive students is go get a fake wedding, go get a cheap wedding ring. Because women are magically more attracted to someone that some other woman has deemed worthy. So. Walmart has really nice ones. Walmart has really nice ones. <laughs> <laughs> we did not plan that. Christian's opinions do not reflect those. Of <laughs> any of our jeweler clients. Scarcity. So kids were asked to rate how delicious a cookie was. One group, the cookie jar had 10 cookies in it. 
The second group, the cookie jar, had two cookies in it. Which one did they rate as tasting better? Even though it's the, ooh, there's a debate. Even though it's the exact same cookie, two wins. Because there were only two cookies. So it magically tasted better because there were fewer, which means they got eaten. So they must be better. The highest paid waiter at Ruth's Chris makes $83,000 a year. He's refused being promoted six times. Refuses to be a manager, says, I'll make, I don't care, I'll make more money waiting tables. Here's a couple of, here's one of his secrets. After the first person orders, he looks over the shoulder and says, oh, I'm sorry. That isn't as good as it normally is tonight. May I suggest something else? And he recommends something cheaper than what they were going to buy. They instantly view him as being on their side. He didn't even upsell them anything. They instantly trust him. And then after everyone orders, he said, would you like me to suggest some wine with your meals? And they say, of course, because he just told us something was bad. So he's on our side. He'll recommend something good. And then there's, would you like me to suggest some dessert? He sells more wine and dessert than anyone in the entire Ruth Chris chain. They have tried, once they figured this out, to train the other wait staff in how to do this. No one will do it. Doesn't matter that they're going to double their pay. Doesn't matter that their patrons will be happier and like them better and come back more often. Nobody does it. So don't worry about your secrets unless you're a cult being revealed because a whole lot of times nobody does it anyway. All right, how to persuade our prospects. What can we do before they even get in the door to get them in a buying mentality that they don't even realize is happening? So there are three principles of persuasion, and we'll go through a ton of examples. It has to be meaningful. It has to be meaningful to the person. So if Christian buys my book, I can't go, you get a free gift of this plate. It means nothing. They're not connected in any way, shape, or form. It has to be unexpected. The return with the second truffle is unexpected. Oh my god, that was so nice of them. And it has to be customized to the person. So depending on what airport you go to, you will see what looks like a Buddhist monk in an orange saffron robe. And they will, as you walk by, they're Hare Krishnas, they will give you a flower. And even just, no, 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 I don't want it. No, thank you. No, 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 please. It's our gift. We insist. And then they will talk about whatever their little spiel is and ask you for a donation. Um, the interesting thing is a much higher percentage of people donate who are given the flower. Now, the really interesting thing is if you follow them, you will see, okay, you gave me a flower. I gave you your donation. I walk about a block in the airport away from the Hare Krishna, and then I toss out the flower because I'm getting on a plane. What am I going to do with the flower? You wait a few minutes and watch, and you will see the Hare Krishna will go to that garbage can, pick out all the flowers that have been thrown out in the last couple minutes, and then give them away all over again all day long. The Disabled Veterans of America did a direct fundraising appeal, direct mail fundraiser, and got an 18% response of people donating, which is an incredibly high response rate for direct mail, asking strangers for money. You know those pre-printed return address labels with the SPCA logo and your name and return address on them? The reason they put those in is because it ups response 35%. Because you feel obligated because they did something nice for you. Even if you throw the damn labels out, you will still more likely to write a check. It has to be customized. So accidentally, because of a printing error, a large retail store that you all shop at mailed out coupons that had no discount on them. Instead of like where it normally says like 20% off, it said 0% off. How many people tried to take the coupon to the store? It said 0%. More of them than when it said 20% off. I didn't put the number on, but it's a huge bump. And even though it said zero, and even though there was no coupon off, nobody was pissed. You would think that oh, that's supposed to be a percentage off. What the heck? Didn't happen. So this is a menswear store. So Sid, the elderly suit salesman, is the top salesperson at that store. 
he tells people he has a hearing problem when he's fitting them for a suit. And then when the customer says how much the suit is, because on this chain there's not a label on it of how much it is, because it's higher end, he calls out to his brother in the back, hey Larry, how much is the blah 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 suit? Larry yells back. Sid pretends he can't hear Larry, yells again. Larry yells back. Sid turns to the customer and tells them a lower price than what Larry says, because he misheard it and sells 90% of the suits. Has a 90% conversion rate because the customers then rush to buy it because they think they're getting a deal because Sid's deaf. So I'm not suggesting that you pretend to have a hearing problem. What? But I'm not here to give you, those people thought they were taking advantage of him. Not a single person said, that's not what Larry said, it's really more money. Every single person said, I'm going to get one over on Sid. Goes to show you our wonderful society. Male college students were shown pictures of college girls who wanted to go on a blind date with them and asked to rate their attractiveness. Second group of male college students was asked to watch the movie Charlie's Angels before they looked at the pictures. What did that do to their attractiveness ratings of the girls? Lower. Dramatically lowers it because they just watched Lucy Liu in a tight leather outfit and Cameron Diaz and Drew Barrymore kick butt. You have three buckets of water, a hot bucket, a cold bucket, a lukewarm bucket. If you put one hand in hot water and one hand in cold water, take them out and then put them in the lukewarm bucket, what happens? Your hot hand now feels cold. Your cold hand now feels hot because of where it just was, because of the comparison. Even though it's actually you don't feel what's really happening. Uh, so Joe and Bob are at a church social. Joe gets up, goes to the church vending machine, buys two Cokes, comes back, gives one to Bob, and then asks him to buy raffle tickets. Magically, how many more tickets does Bob buy when given a Coke first? A whole lot more. So, some principles of persuasion on how you can put this into work in your business. If you want them to buy something expensive, have them first write down a much bigger number. If you're selling something that's $5,000, have them write down $10,000 first. Subconsciously, yours will feel more affordable in comparison. So, I real estate agents, you tell them the rice price range for, I'm looking for a $300,000 house. Magically, the first few houses you look at will be $350,000, $400,000. Didn't they hear you? Yeah, they heard you. They're doing it on purpose. There's another uh, real estate company that will specifically show you something way lower than you asked for. They have five, they actually bought and kept on their books three houses that were in rundown shape. And they specifically take their customers to go see those first so that those people, oh my God, these are dumps. And then when they show them the normal house, it looks way better by comparison. Another restaurant example, if you want them to choose a French wine, have French music playing in the background. They won't even realize it and magically more of them will buy the French wine. If you want someone to try a new product, something they've never bun before, ask them first if they consider themselves a curious or adventurous person. Because once they say yes, they are more likely to try something new. Because they've defined themselves as adventurous. I thought this was really interesting. If you want them to buy something that's popular, show them a scary movie first. When people watch scary movies first, they bought the more popular items as opposed to something that wasn't as being sold as much. Safety in numbers, safety in the crowd, not sure. Um, I, got, I was looking for a new iPhone game to play with Max, my 10-year-old, and happened upon this thing called Stranger Things. I had never seen the show or read the book. I just started playing the game. We started playing the game together. The reason I was looking for a new game was because he had picked the last one and he has way more time to play than I do and I have no chance. Like when we play Madden on the Xbox, I lose, I'm worse than the Bills, I lose, I, I will play as the Patriots, he will play as the Cleveland Browns and beat me by like 54 points. It's not pretty. So I said, I'm picking the next game so, and I'm gonna play it before you so I've got a shot. So we're playing Stranger Things and there's this whole plot that I know nothing about. And then Rebecca's like, have you heard about this Stranger Things show? I'm like, it's a show? She's like, it's on HBO. All of my friends are talking about it. It's everywhere on my newsfeed. 
which is a whole other conversation because my wife lives in her newsfeed. So when she sees something on her newsfeed, she says, everybody's talking about it. And I said, who's everybody? Well, it's on my Facebook. I'm like, if you look at my newsfeed, no one's talking about it. It depends on who you're friends with. You're friends with a ton of other stay-at-home moms, and all my friends are entrepreneurs. So I'm like, okay, I guess I'll watch Stranger Things. So I start watching Stranger Things, and Rebecca says, oh, should I watch it? Rebecca's idea of a scary movie is like Legally Blonde. Um, she does not do scary. If there's aliens, if there's sharks, if there's any s dramatic music, she's out. Um, so I said, probably not. It's, I'm, only, I'm watching the first episode. There's a kid who disappears. It's creepy. She says, all my friends say it's not scary. I'm like, okay. We start watching the first seven minutes. She's done. Um, she's like, oh my God, it's terrible. Um, I, I get to episode like two and a half, and Max is like, can I watch Daddy? I'm like, no. He's like, I'm not scared of a missing kid or aliens or any of that stuff. I'm like, right, but then you're going to have night, keep us awake for three nights. So no. If you want them to feel warmly towards you, hand them a hot drink. So our own temple, Sheer Shalom in the gift shop, doesn't know they're doing this, but stop into the gift shop for a complimentary cup of coffee or tea. Now, I didn't create this. I didn't do a split test, but I guarantee you that more people who get the cup of coffee or tea will buy more than the people who don't get it. Because they feel all nice and warm. It's also why if you come to our office, I've told Kristen, stop offering water. Offer coffee or tea first. If they ask for water, we'll give it to them, but make them ask for it because I want them getting something warm in their hands. If you want them to help you, have them look at people, pictures of people standing close together. They subconsciously feel more connected. If you want them to focus on what they're going to achieve, show them a picture of a runner winning a race. Because then it's all about that, that person winning. If you want them to be careful and take their time, show them a picture of Rodin's sculpture, The Thinker. Um, we, uh, he did a test with Boy Scouts, and the Boy Scouts asked if people wanted to buy tickets to the Boy Scout circus that was in town. And whenever anybody said no, they said, how about buying some of our big chocolate bars? And sold out of all their chocolate bars because they were a, it's a down sell from physically going to a circus. Incidentally, there's a movie coming out on, uh, around Christmas called The Greatest Showman, which I'm excited to see because I believe it's about P.T. Barnum, who is one of our world's most brilliant marketers. Um, make a larger request first, get rejected, then ask for what you really want. Because then they're doing you a favor by taking the lot. They owe you something because they didn't take the first offer. So I did not know this. This is really fascinating. This is actually how Watergate happened. So here's what happened. Um, all right, so G. Gordon Liddy, who was in charge of intelligence gathering for the committee to reelect the president, reelect Nixon, came up with a first proposal that was over a million dollars. The proposal included um, specially equipped communications chase planes to eavesdrop on the Democrats. It included break-ins at not just Watergate, but a number of other offices. It included a kidnapping squad. It included a mugging squad. And it included a yacht where he was going to hire high-class call girls to seduce and blackmail Democratic politicians. The budget was over a million dollars. Nixon and his team wisely said no. He came back with a $500,000 plan, They again, where they cut some stuff out. They wisely said no. He came back with a $250,000 plan to just burglarize Watergate. And they said, well, we felt we had to give him something, so we said yes. And then ended his presidency. So this is a letter using these examples of persuasion written from a college daughter to her parents. Dear mom and dad, since I left for college, I have been remiss in writing, and I'm sorry for my thoughtlessness in not writing before. I will bring you up to date now, but before you read, please sit, up, please sit down. You're not to read any further unless you are sitting down, OK? I'm getting along pretty well now. The skull fracture and concussion I got when I jumped out of the window in my dormitory when it caught on fire shortly after my arrival here is pretty well healed now. I only spent two weeks in the hospital. Now I can see almost normal and only get headaches that make me sick once a day. Fortunately, the fire in the dormitory and my jump was witnessed by an attendant at the gas station near the dorm. He was the one who called the fire department and the ambulance. He also visited me in the hospital. And since I, since I had nowhere to live because of the burnout dormitory, he was kind enough to invite me to share his apartment with him. 
It's really a basement room, but it's kind of cute. He's a very fine boy, and we have fallen deeply in love and are planning to get married. We haven't gotten the exact date yet, but it will be before my pregnancy begins to show. Yes, Mom and Dad, I am pregnant. I know how much you are looking forward to being grandparents, and I know you will welcome the baby and give it the same tender love and care that you gave me when I was a child. The reason for the delay in our marriage is that my boyfriend has a minor infection, which prevents us from getting our premarital blood tests, and I carelessly caught it from him. Now that I brought you out of, up to date, I want to tell you there was no fire. I did not have a concussion or a skull fracture. I was not in the hospital. I am not pregnant. I am not engaged. I am not infected, and there is no boyfriend. However, I am getting a D in American history, and I wanted you to see that in its proper perspective. <laughs> The problem is that Max, my 10-year-old son, is watching our YouTube videos, and I can catch him starting to use this stuff on my wife. He knows, he tried it once with me, I was like, dude, you watch my video. He's like, I'm signed into YouTube as you, I can watch all your stuff, I don't have to pay to see the videos. I'm like, shoot. Um, so I've had to start not being able to use some of my own stuff because I have to tell Rebecca so that she knows when Max is trying to manipulate her. All right, the American Cancer Society, this is really interesting, they called and asked people if they would consider spending three hours going in their neighborhood collecting money for the American Cancer Society. Magically, the majority of those people declined. Then they called a different group and said, would you might consider spending three hours collecting money for ACS in the future? A lot of those people said, yes, I might consider it. Three, weeks late, three days later, they called and said, okay, would you be a neighborhood canvasser? Three days ago, you said you might consider helping us. Now will you actually do it? 700% more people did it when they had the little request first. In politics, they've been asking people in the poll, not who are you going to vote for, but would you predict if you're going to vote on election day? The people who said, yeah, I predict I'll vote, magically more of them showed up to actually vote. There was a hunger, a hunger relief charity that said, can we send a rep to your home to sell you cookies? The proceeds are to get hunger relief. 18% of the people said, sure. When they changed it and asked, how are you feeling this evening first? What did it do to the 18%? 32%, almost double. 89% of those people actually bought the cookies. This one blew my mind. So this was a Make California Beautiful, Safer Driver campaign. They went door to door and they said, would you put this giant five foot sign on your lawn that says drive carefully? 83% said, no, I'm not putting that ugly piece of crap on my lawn. Try number two, two weeks before they said, would you put a three inch sign that you can barely see that says be a safe driver? Two weeks later, 70% of those people agreed to the giant ugly sign little business card on their lawn that says drive safer magically gets them to agree to the giant ugly sign because they already committed to being a safe driver. In New York City, they left a wallet on the ground in Midtown Manhattan. It had $20 in it, a check for $26.30, and normal credit cards, driver's license, identifying the name and address of the owner. There was also a letter in the wallet from the owner, from someone else who had said, I found your wallet trying to return it. So it looks like it got lost the first time, somebody picked it up, tried to get it back to them, and it got lost again, and you're finding it. What they found was, when the letter was written in broken English by a self-identified, recently arrived foreigner, the wallet was only returned 33% of the time. When the letter was written by an affluent Manhattanite, how many more people returned it? 70% because that person was like them or better than them and they wanted to go with it and return it as opposed to the foreigner who tried to send the wallet back that they didn't relate to. The world's, greatest car, Carl, the world's greatest car salesman is Joe Girard. He's in the Guinness Book of World Records. He's got an amazing book called How to Sell Anything to Anybody. Um, he sold more cars than anyone in history and every month of the year, we've talked about the warm, fuzzy holiday cards. We've talked about how there's a random holiday no one's ever heard of every month. Like July is National Blueberry Month. He sends a postcard every month that just says, I like you on it. I like you, that's it. It just says, I like you, signed his name. 
also at a Tupperware party, there are a number of principles in play. There is reciprocity. Games are played throughout the party. Prizes are won. And I didn't know this, but anyone who doesn't win any of the games, there is a prize bag that she gets to pick from to make sure that everyone has had the feeling of winning something. Commitment, consistency, and social proof. They make every participant describe what they like about Tupperware and how they use it. So even if you've never had Tupperware before, presumably you've had some plastic food container that you will make up something about. Um, social proof, every person buying, of course, generates more momentum for other people to buy. Authority and liking, people want to buy for the hostess, not because they desperately need more plastic containers that they can get at Wegmans. So Rebecca's to the point now, somehow, thank you for not being in this group, every one of her friends is into some network marketing company. It's either a candle party, a jewelry party, a Lula Row dress party, a flower party. There's 87 different parties. Tastefully simple, Mary Kay. And now when any of our friends will text her and say, hey, I'm going to have a party, they don't even have to say that there's something in it. Rebecca knows this isn't really a party. It's an MLM sales pitch. And damn it, if I go, I have to buy something. And I said, you don't. There's no rule. I said, you've been to this woman's 31 party. She's had three 31 parties. You have three bags we don't need. You don't have to buy anymore. Yeah, I do. I can't be the only one there who doesn't buy something for her. I'm like, can we just write her a check and you and I go on a date and you skip the party if she needs money? No, I got to go. I got to buy the damn thing. I'm like, can we get you in a network marketing company so we can have a party and get some of the money back? No, I don't want to do that to people. But you'll let everyone else do it to you. So just in case you didn't know, there is a Tupperware party somewhere on the planet every 15 minutes, and they sell $2.5 million worth of Tupperware every single day. All right, so let's examine a persuasive, influential sales script. And I hope you have pencil and paper or something to write with. So I'm gonna give you, I'm gonna demonstrate the script as we wrote it, as executed for a client, I'm going to do the intonation and inflection. There are points you're going to think I'm crazy. There are points you're going to think this is way over the top. I would never do it. Just trust me. I felt uncomfortable doing it. It just works. And we'll talk about the psychology. We'll talk about why it works. We'll break it down. And then we'll talk about what the, how you can write one yourself. And we had a contest. So the person who brought the most guests this month will write one for that person right here. But we're going to dive right in. So this is for, I'm going to tell you who this is for. Um, so if you've ever watched Shark Tank, um, Kevin Harrington is one of my business partners and the co-host of my podcast. He has a mastermind group devoted to investing in his deals. So all of the products that he invests in, all the companies he takes to market, he brings to this mastermind group and everyone else has a chance to write a check and be a part of the next Snuggie. And of course, these aren't public. These aren't Wall Street publicly traded companies. You can't get them anywhere else. You can't get invest when Kevin's on the board and growing the company, doing the infomercial and whatever else he's doing to grow it. So it's the Mastermind Investment Club. And we are doing the market, in addition to speaking at the club and being the marketing firm that helps, we're also doing the marketing to get members for this club. So we're generating leads every single day of people who are interested in joining this. This is the script that their sales team followed, that we wrote for their sales team to call those prospects and get them to hand over their credit card for 3,500 bucks to join the club. Are you with me? Okay. So these are accredited investors. You've got to have at least a million dollar net worth to be in the club because these are all non-public investments. So you've got to meet some certain SEC and FINRA criteria in order to be able to invest in them. John, Ed Bracken, Kevin Harrington's Mastermind Investment Club. How's it going today? Great. Now, if you may recall, you recently applied to get more information to learn about access to Shark Tank deals with Kevin from Shark Tank. Does that ring a bell? Now, I use specific intonation and inflection, which make it grammatically wrong, but you'll see Kevin Harrington's Mastermind Investment Club. How's it going? Ed Bracken. Those are question marks because I'm asking it like a question. Because as we learn from persuasion and influence, subconsciously, if I drop my intonation at the end, it's a command. It's a statement. It's a declarative. And people subconsciously, if they're talking to someone they don't know, will subconsciously resist it. If you do it like a question, subconsciously, you automatically try and answer it. 
you will also notice there's consistency and reciprocity because the consistency is they applied. They already requested that information. So we are, they have to remain consistent with that. And there's reciprocity coming up because we gave them something when they opted in, when they applied. Does that ring a bell? Yes. If you've got 60 seconds, I've got an idea I'd like to share with you. You got a minute? That's what we call the reasonable man tone. You got a minute? Everybody's got a minute. If you said, I want to talk to you for an hour, you get hung up on, they don't have time, they're busy. You got a minute? It's disarming. The conversation is going to take longer than that, and they know it's going to take longer than that. But because you got a minute, everybody's got a minute. I have learned the hard way that when I'm trying to leave the office, and Bruce says, you got a minute, <laughs> just got a quick question about a client, honey, I'm going to be late, because <laughs> it's not a minute. Um, John, just a couple of quick questions so I can best serve you. I'm getting more of their commitment both to answer those questions and participate in the process. And these questions are qualifying questions to make, to, that will build in intensity to make sure that this is right for them. Because one of the conditions is you have to use this for good and you shouldn't close people who shouldn't really buy from you. You should only use this on people that you know your service can help that should actually be participating. Can never have too much bacon. All right, so in this case, this is the three questions that escalate in intensity and disclosure. So the first one, slightly dissonant, hey, what type of non-stock market investments have you made in the past? Because Kevin doesn't want the 3,500 bucks. The 3,500 bucks to join is just to make sure they're serious. Kevin wants them to write checks to be in his deals, and those checks might be 10,000, 50,000, 100,000, a million dollars to buy a percentage of cool locks. So Kevin doesn't care about the 3,500 bucks. He cares about, are they a player? Can they, are, are they used to writing checks that are not for something on the stock exchange, that they can look at a statement every day? Because there's no statements on these companies. Like they're gonna look at something and not see anything for a while. Or if they're doing something that's the infomercial's running next month, they're not gonna find out for a month what's happening. Um, so they start telling us a story about what type of non-stock market investments they've made. Next, tell me about two recent investments you made, one that worked and one that didn't. Because we need people, if they are not disturbed, will not do anything. Uh, Jimmy, can I throw you under the bus for a minute? Okay, so Jimmy told me a story earlier today how his brother, I think it was, told him that if you buy a gym membership, you'll get in shape and you'll lose weight. So he bought, he said, and what was it? I think it was the average was 40 pounds. Okay, so Jimmy wanted to lose 80 pounds, so he bought two gym memberships. And then six months or whatever goes by, or a year, whatever, however long it was, and Jimmy says, I haven't lost any weight yet. And I bought the gym memberships. And his brother says, well, what are you doing at the gym? And Jimmy says, what do you mean? He says, well, I bought the gym memberships. And he says, no, you actually have to go. So then he goes, I got So Jimmy starts going to the gym. A couple months go by, haven't lost any weight yet, haven't lost any weight yet. And his brother says, how come you haven't lost any weight yet? I thought you were going to the gym. He says, I am going to the gym. He's all right, well, I'm going to go with you and see what you're doing. So he goes to the gym, and Jimmy sits down at the juice bar, and he networks with everybody, and he has a good time, and he leaves. His brother says, no, 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 you actually got to work out, like five days a week, and you got to eat right, and then it'll work. So we want to uncover their pain. Thank you for being a good sport about that. I didn't tell the story entirely right, I'm sure, but close enough. So... They won't move, they won't buy, they won't do anything unless they're disturbed enough. You've got to uncover some of their pain, which is why we're asking you about a deal that didn't work out. Because in case there's an objection later, the deal that didn't work out is going to overcome that objection. And then the biggest disclosure, this club is only for accredited investors. Do you meet the requirements to be accredited? Now, there's two answers to this question. Yes, I do, because they know what it is. And no, I don't. Nine times out of 10, we found when they say no, they don't even know what the requirements are. They're just assuming they don't meet them. So we automatically, if they say no, we automatically say what the requirements are. Just to be sure, the requirements to be a creditor are blankety, blankety, blank. Do you meet those requirements? And we're finding a bunch of them. Are, yeah, actually, I do. I didn't know that. They just assumed they didn't qualify, which is interesting because in the ads, it says, attention, accredited investors only. 
in both all of the steps of the sales funnel, in big letters, it says this is only for accredited investors. They think they don't qualify, but they fill them all out anyway. Based on what you're telling me, John, the Mastermind Investment Club is a perfect fit for you. Let me explain why. And again, I'm hitting perfect fit. Again, sometimes it seems over the top, but it works. So then I have three bullet points that I'm going to use, three or four, to sell them in increasing intensity on what they, why they should do this, why it's a perfect fit. You're gonna get the opportunity to invest inside deals alongside Shark Tank's Kevin Harrington. These are deals he's personally vetted and is investing his own money in. A lot of times he's on their board and is helping make sure they're successful. With $5 billion in sales under, under his belt, that's a pretty good track record, right? You'll notice I'm getting them to agree to each question. So I had them, I asked them three other questions. I'm asking them three more at the end. So they're gonna have agreed like six or seven times before I ask them for anything. So I'm building up those micro commitments, that six or seven steps of consistency. So their natural subconscious flow is yes, 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 yes. It's a whole lot easier to get the last yes of give me your credit card if I've got six in a row than it is if I said no six times. You'll notice it depending on if you go to any conferences where there are speakers who are selling from the stage. There are a couple training companies in that industry that all teach the same thing. So if you're this principle, so if the speaker at your conference asks like five or six questions where the answer is yes or yes, raise your hand, they're doing it for that exact reason. Because it will be much easier to get you to raise your hand or run to the back of the room later if you said yes a whole bunch of times. Next to Kevin is Bert Ullman, the $6 billion branding mogul. He was VP at DKNY. He took Damon John's FUBU from 70 to 700 million and Russell's Fat Farm, I forget what the numbers are. He also did the largest celebrity deal in history for $2.3 billion with Kohl's with Jennifer Lopez and Mark Anthony. Does that make sense how Bert using his Rolodex for us can make any company more valuable? Yeah, wow, that'd be awesome. If you get a celebrity spokesperson for anything, you could instantly get national credibility and make a whole lot more money. Uh, then we've got Michael Fugler structuring the way we all invest in the deals. He's an investment banker and attorney. He's chairman of the Investment Banker Advisory Committee. He's head of the Euro X whatever stock exchange. We're very lucky to have him in the foxhole with us reducing our risk. Sound good? Yes. It's great. Get started today and believe me if I'm even half right, the only problem you will have is you didn't do it sooner. Fair enough? And fair enough is a question. Fair enough? Getting started is easy. I just need some basic information from you and then we'll get you on the list to look at Kevin's next deal and attend our next event. And that's the first close. We're assuming that salesmanship doesn't start until they say no. We want the objection because then we have to get them all out of the way so that we can overcome it. You'll also notice that the first objection we've found ourselves is never the real reason why they're saying no. Nine times out of 10, it is a smoke screen. So you'll see in this script, we're ignoring whatever their objection is and answering it the same way. So whatever the reason is, Tayton, give me a reason. Why aren't you joining the club? Make something up. I don't have any money. I, 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 no, go with, that's fine. I don't have any money. I hear what you're saying, Tayton, but let me ask you a question. Does the idea make sense to you? Do you like the idea? Acts exactly. It really is an incredible opportunity. And then I go into one of four bullet points talking about how fabulous it is, again, in increasing intensity to get her over that hump. Now, if it comes back that next time I ask for the close, she still doesn't have any money. She's got a commitment and a consistency issue because she said she was an accredited investor. She presumably has a million dollar liquid net worth. I don't have any money isn't a real objection. Now, it could translate into everything I own is already invested in something and I can't sell it. She could mean she's not liquid, but she can't say she doesn't have any money because she already agreed to being an accredited investor. She agreed to like six other things and now she agreed she likes the idea, which I'm going to use later. Um, so I've got a social proof bullet. Kevin has taken over 50,000 pitches and sees 10,000 more every single year. When you see that many deals, you learn a lot about how to pick winners. That means he gets to choose only the very best deals to invest in. Make sense? Yes, number eight. Awesome, let's get started. You know, you want Visa, MasterCard, Amex, Discover. Um, 
if they're, depending on what that objection was, um, Greg Reiter was the youngest owner of an investment bank in US history. He's been vetting deals for 30 years and knows exactly what to invest in and more importantly, what to avoid. I went softer on what to avoid. You get to benefit from all his experience without the pain of that learning curve. Sound good? Awesome, let's get started. Um, Rolodex, Burnt Ullman can literally get anyone to come to the table that we need. Let me tell you about a deal Burnt just did. So in um, Carl Lagerfeld, the fashion designer, is designing a condo building, an apartment building in New York City in like Fifth Avenue in Manhattan. And normal comps in New York City on Fifth Avenue where it's like $2,000 a square foot. Carl Lagerfeld is putting his name on the building. He's doing all the design. He's picking all the colors. He's picking the sconces and the wallpaper and the couches and literally is totally designed for you. And now it's 14,000 a square foot to live in. That's burnt brought Carl to the table and that constant condo building is instantly seven times more valuable. Do you see how burnt getting anybody and any celebrity involved could make something more valuable? Yes, awesome. And then Michael's investment contracts, make sure we take the least amount of risk possible. We can't hit a grand slam home run on every deal, but we can make sure we don't strike out too often. So those are my four, depending on what their actual objection was. Um, one we get a lot is call me back. Got to think about it. I hear what you're saying, John, but let me just say this. I've been in this business 10 years, and if there's one thing I've learned, it's when people say, I'll call you back in a few days, what ends up happening is they end up putting the idea in the back of their mind and deciding against it. Not because they don't like the idea. In fact, I know you do like it. You just said you did. But the simple fact is we're both very busy people. You'll go back to your busy life and you'll end up missing out on this. And I don't want that to happen to you. I'm the new best friend. In fact, let me say this. One of the true beauties of the program is right now, pick another one that I haven't used yet. And I keep going back on this endless loop of overcoming, close the deal. Um, we've got a couple different ones. John, let me ask you an honest question. What's the worst that could possibly happen here? Is 3,500 for the next year gonna keep you from going out to dinner with your wife? Of course it, it, it won't. And this is a really important line, but what it will do is serve as a benchmark for future business. It will show you we can deliver on what we promise and then a close. But notice how I'm setting them up. But what it will do is serve as a benchmark for future business. I'm setting up, this is just the first sale. Because in this case, the 3,500 is to get him in the door. Kevin's going to keep asking him for checks to participate in his deal. This is just to show him we can deliver so that they're ready for the fact that they're going to get asked for money more often. Now, Kevin doesn't get a commission on it. He doesn't make anything off of them putting 50 grand into Coolbox. He just gets to fund stuff faster and get a bigger infomercial or a bigger presence because he's got investors in the company and he doesn't have to invest all of his own money in every deal. Does that make sense? So why don't we do this? Get started today, and if you do even half as well as our other clients, social proof. The only problem you'll have is you didn't sign up sooner. Um, we've got a couple for when they are really trying to say no. John, let me ask you a question. If you've been a member for the last 12 months, investing in deals alongside Kevin, and watching your portfolio grow enormously, you probably wouldn't be saying, let me think about it right now. You'd be saying, sign me up. Am I right? Reasonable man talk. Am I right? Yeah, yeah, if I had been seeing deals for the last 12 months and making money, yeah, of course, I wouldn't be saying no now. All right, so you just haven't done it yet. So let's reverse pace you in time and get you into the future. Uh, this is like our last ditch shot. If we're really feeling like we got in, that this person's being difficult. John, you mean to tell me that if we were delivering Shark Tank type deals to you, you wouldn't be saying, let's get started now on the spot? Come on. Again, it's over the top. But this one I'm only using if I got nothing left to lose. I'm like this guy is desperately trying to get off the phone. I'm taking one last shot before I hang up. And we've actually seen them turn around and have it work. A lot of times they will laugh and go, you're right, you're right, you're right. Uh, we're obviously not getting rich on your investment, but this will serve as a benchmark for future business. John, let me ask you a question. Given things I've been going in your portfolio over the last 12 months, where do you see yourself in a year from now? Or even worse, five years. And here I would fill in when they, I asked them, give me an investment you made that didn't work out. I would replace, given things I've been going in your portfolio, with remember that deal that you bought, that non-publicly traded real estate investment trust that went south? Do you really want more of those? Are things gonna be more intense? If you keep buying those, are you gonna get more sleepless nights and worrying? 
So I'm twisting the knife a little bit based on the negative information they gave me earlier. I get it, Sean. I've been around the block a couple thousand times now. And I know these things typically don't resolve themselves unless you take serious action to resolve them. In fact, let me say this. One of the true beauties is one of my four that I haven't used yet. Presumably, I'm not getting four objections and I'm not using all four. Um, John, please don't misconstrue my enthusiasm for pressure. It's just that I know this truly is a perfect fit for you. So why don't we do this? Blah, 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 blah. Because sometimes if you go too far, people will say, hey, stop pressuring me. OK. So why do you want to, um, we're going to get into writing an actual script in a minute. But why would you want to do that? What we found is it can totally change your business. Because it eliminates, we found it gets rid of most sales resistance. The conversion rates are going up significantly versus just calling and trying to have a normal conversation that you would normally have to try and get somebody in the door. So how it changes your business, I'm going over here. So I'm going to draw, full disclosure, Kristen's our visual designer, not me. I am a terrible graphic artist. She's going to cringe and try not to twitch too much as I draw. So there are what I've learned, what I like to call the five circles of wealth. Um, I guess I'm going this way. I'll draw small circles. So the first one is I'm the doer of the thing. I am the financial planner. I am the attorney. I provide the financial advice. I am actually doing the work. That's doer. You can be a great doer. You can be in the top 30 nationwide in your company. You can do a great job at it. You can make lots of money doing that. The next circle of wealth that gets bigger is when you stop being the doer of the thing and you start being the marketer of the thing. You stop thinking like a financial planner, accountant, window contractor, insurance agent, and you start thinking as a business owner. And you start thinking about marketing financial services as opposed to providing financial services. With me so far? Doer of the thing, marketer of the thing, Then there is the info marketer of the thing. So this is, I know how to be a financial planner. I know how to market financial planning. This is, I'm now going to sell other financial advisors how I marketed my financial practice. So this then becomes, I start teaching other people, whether it's coaching, whether it's products, whether it's a book, I start teaching other people how to do what I just did. Or, is I become a joint venture company. I start going to other people who sell services to financial advisors and getting them to promote my products and services, thus getting me in front of a whole bunch of other potential clients, not one at a time, not five at a time, but thousands or tens of thousands at a time. Joint ventures or affiliate relationships. So right now, um, we're working on a, James and I are working on a deal. Kevin Harrington recently bought all of the rights to all of the intellectual property of everything Zig Ziglar has ever created. Every book, every speech, every product, every course, every, every, everything. And he is remastering and relaunching it for Zig for the 21st century. So he's been locked in a video studio for months shooting his take on every single thing Zig has ever created, his own content of his selling and how he does stuff and we're launching a giant new product course, whole big a live event, whole big thing around Kevin and Zig. So one of the things James is doing for us is James says, man, network marketing people love Zig Ziglar. They love motivational sales stuff. He's like, I built a software program that's a subscription service and I have 33,000 network marketers who pay for it every month. Right now we've got John Maxwell and two other guys in it as the, con as like the motivational sales guys. I could plug Zig into that site in two seconds and push it out to 33,000 people and poof, we've got a whole lot of sales. So that's a joint venture partnership and Kevin is super excited. Number five is, you're cringing? Yes, I know it's a lousy circle, almost. <laughs> Number five is strategic acquisition. So that would be, I go start buying out other companies in the supply chain. So if I'm an accountant, maybe I buy a financial services company. Maybe I buy a legal company. 
Maybe instead of we're just an accounting office, now all of a sudden you come, we're a one-stop shop and you come in and there's financial advisors, there's attorneys, there's all sorts of other related professions under one roof. And now we're building a chain of national offices and a national brand. So for example, um, a number of you know our client, mastermind member, speaker, and my brother-in-law, Dr. Corey Malnikoff, who started as a chiropractor. We worked to become really, really good at marketing chiropractic, got to 12 chiropractic offices. Then we worked to make him a speaker and an author so that he is teaching other chiropractors how to do what he did. Then we were working on joint venture partnerships with other folks in the chiropractic industry. And then we said, you know what? Let's just go start buying up other clinics and putting our, st our systems into place and our logo and our umbrella, putting them under our umbrella. And then we were set to acquire another 12 in 2018, doubling their size. And then Vivian, my wonderful sister-in-law, got pregnant with child number three. So we're waiting a year and then we'll go acquire 12 more because he's gonna not travel for a year to be there for her and the baby. So those are the five circles of wealth. And this helps in all of them because you start off with a script being a doer of the thing, getting more people to hire you for your divorce or whatever it is, or your taxes. Then you can sell it to other people. You can teach them how to do it. You can joint venture with others to bring you giant leverage, and then you can just buy up other companies. Does that make sense? Awesome. You know what's cool about that is you, it's a uh, very small business biography that has been making for over the last 100 years. And that's Walt. I have read Walt. Yeah. I, am, I have read probably a dozen books on Walt. Um, huge Walt fan. Does he just buy stocks? Yeah. Yes. Oh, yes. Yeah. The interesting thing is Dan is all, Dan Kennedy is also a huge Walt fan. So I'm going to tell you two quick Dan and Walt stories, and then we'll dive, dive in. Um, so Dan and two of his partners about 50 years ago had an option on land in Orlando um, where part of where Disney is now and where the giant like three-story McDonald's is at Disney now. He and two of his friends had an option on that land, um, and this was before Dan was Dan. And every year the option was a couple grand and they would renew it, they would renew it, they would renew it. And then one year, two of the other guys couldn't make their payments. They were having bad years. And Dan said, eh, screw it, I'll let it go. And they let it go and Disney bought the land. And had they hung on and sold it to Disney, Dan would not be Dan because he would have just retired. Um, the second one is Dan is a avid Disney collector and has um, bought the original drawing um, that Walt did when he sketched out the Disney, mark, Disney plan, like this thing, with all of the different things they were gonna have one day. A, it looks a whole lot like this, and B, the fact that he figured that out and had TV networks and magazines and movie, all this stuff, back before there was even much of a park, is just absolutely visionary genius. Um, one of the one of my and we've done whole sessions on Disney, but one of my favorites is that when um, before the park was up, they put a trailer, and the trailer was the Disney Information Center at the time, and people would come to the Information Center and get a brochure on what was coming and hear about it. And Walt came down one day and was really mad, and he said, "There's people coming. Sell them something." It's like they're coming to. Well, we're just giving them brochures. There's no park. We can't sell tickets. He goes, "Come up, get a T-shirt. Come up with something. There are people coming. Let's sell them something. If they show up, bill them." So we, we've had this debate in my house uh, because Rebecca, before she became a stay-at-home mom, is a, a family therapist. And she will get calls from her friends all the time. Uh, my daughter's acting out, whatever, something's going on, can you help me? And she'll give them free therapy over the phone. Or she'll get, she has one friend who will text her a lot for, can you meet me for lunch? She goes, you're not going for lunch. You're going to do unpaid therapy. She goes, I know, I know. I'm like, will you please start billing these people? or t send them to me, I'll take their credit cards. Like you're wasting, your, you're giving it away for free. She's not worth 10 bucks an hour, she's worth hundreds. So anyway, all right. All right, so questions to ask to build yourself a script like that. And then we'll build one. 
What time we got? Got enough time. Okay, so obviously, who are you? What is your name? What is your company name? What did your prospect opt in for? An opt in doesn't have to be online. They could have faxed back a 16 page sales letter. Um, they could have called you, they could have asked you a question, but what were they looking for? And what did they hope to gain by doing that? Because you're going to use all of these in that script. What are your three qualifying questions in increasing intensity and disclosure? What do you need to know from them to know that they're a good prospect for you and that they're serious? Because we don't want to waste our time with people who are just kicking tires. And then what are your three bullet points that you're going to use after they answer those questions to sell them in increasing intensity about the amazing service or product you're going to offer? What are the most common reasons they don't take advantage of your offer? What are their objections that you hear every day? Because we're going to write bullets that overcome those in advance. So. We're going to do that now. Um, let's see. Guess who is our winner? Who brought, uh, Bill, you brought Paul. So you got one. Anybody got more than one? Adrian brought Paul. Another Paul. You're tied. Um, right. We're going to have to do some type of drawing. Yes. And Larry and Mitch, I invited, and they brought each other. <laughs> all right. So, all right. So Adrian and Bill, somebody here. Anybody got a quarter? We'll flip a quarter. Ha, Titan wins. <laughs> All right, uh, Adrian, call it in the air. Heads. Heads it is? Here's your quarterback. All right, um, do we have room? Yeah. Two out of three. I'm going to put my coat on your chair. I'm going to move over here. Did you eat already? Yes, I'm all set. You're all set, okay. You could have. It's just like football. You could have given it to Bill, but I don't know what you would get in the second half. Exactly. There is no second half. Yes, there is no second half. That'll be your chair. I'm going to stand. All right. All right. Uh, so who, you are Adrian Rostein Grace. Your company name is? Transitioning Finances. Transitioning Finances. Okay. And what did they opt in for? What are they... What is the initial thing that makes them make contact with you? Um, divorce, financial troubles. Divorce, financial troubles. Okay, and what are they ultimately looking to gain by talking to you? A better settlement. A better divorce settlement. Not, not, no, they're looking to gain financial security. They want confidence. Financial security and confidence. Okay. All right, what do we need to know from them to know that they are serious and a good prospect for you? You don't, don't worry about the order or anything. Just, I'm a prospect, what do you, want to, what do you need to know? Um, I don't think in, in, some, in some kind of order, well. Don't do order, know, just do you, random. You know, are you, are you uh, contemplating or in the middle of a divorce? Okay, first thing we have to know is if they're not getting divorced, the way she helps them is gonna be totally different, right? right? They might be a regular financial planning client, but they won't be a divorce client. And we're focused on divorce at this moment in this exercise. Okay, so we need to know if they're getting divorced or not. That's kind of, that would probably be the first one, probably the least intense one, because they know if they're thinking about getting divorced or not. Um, what else do we, so we've qualified them that they're getting divorced. What else do we need to know? Are you afraid of uh, what the divorce is gonna mean to you financially? It's a good one. Are you afraid of what, the, I would maybe change, are afraid to, are you concerned? Okay. This is being recorded. Yeah. All right. Are you concerned at all about what the divorce might mean to you financially? Again, we want the answer to all three of these to be yes. It, we sh if we got the right person, it should be a no-brainer. So yes, I'm getting divorced. Yes, I'm concerned about what's going to happen to me monetarily wise. And then what else do I need to know? Um, are you looking for some help? Would you like some help with that? Okay. Are you looking for some help? Okay, I'm going to tweak the word help because while women are different than men and men don't like to admit that they need help, 
there are probably some women who help might have a negative connotation for, some might have a positive connotation. Some might be happy to ask for help. Um, so would you, maybe, would, are you looking for some assistance with that? Something like that. Yeah, help is not a good word. Yeah. Support. Support. <coughs> Resources. Okay, so we've got three questions. And then, okay, they said yes, yes, yes. Okay, based on what you're telling me, Jane, our blank is a perfect fit for you. What is our blank? What are we selling? What is our package? Um, what is the first thing we want to sell them? Um, a divorce financial plan. A divorce financial plan. Okay, so based on what you're telling me, Jane, our divorce financial plan is a perfect fit for you. Let me tell you why. Why is our divorce financial plan a perfect fit? Okay. Understand what their options are moving forward. Okay. So that they can negotiate from a position of knowledge and confidence. Okay, so you're gonna tell them, you're gonna analyze where they are, you're gonna talk about what their choices are so that they can feel good, and then what's, what, what's point number one? Get a better settlement. And help you get a better settlement, which obviously um, they'll get more money. Okay. Or at least understand what money is possible. Okay, uncover all of the money possible that should be rightfully yours or something. Something like that. Something like that, okay. Peace of mind. Peace of mind? Yeah. If they're worried, I would, I would have one of them do something along my lines. So that you can have, the, we're gonna do blanks so that you can have peace of mind. And uh, I can refer them to the rest of the professional team that they will need to succeed in their divorce. Okay, somebody have a pen. Awesome, so. Actually, you know what? I've got this fabulous pad. Right. Not being huge. Okay, so I've got, let's see here. I would say able to retain the house for the kids that have the stability of living in the same house in the same neighborhood. We don't know if they have kids yet. We're getting there though. We're not getting there yet. We're getting there. We're getting there. Okay, so we talked about losing the cap. All right. We talked about, what are your three bullet points? Okay, so um, we talked about know where you are. Or what you have. Know, where you, know what you have. We talked about what your options are. We talked about um, more money. And obviously we want peace of mind. And we talked about support. So we're gonna use some of these in different parts of our script. And as Dean brought up, we brought up the house and kids. Because Adrian's not the lawyer. She can't guarantee they'll keep the house. Right, and sometimes they shouldn't. Right. Right. Okay. All right, so we will tell the, um, we will help you take a look at your situation, identify where you are um, so that you know what you have and can negotiate from a position of strength and of confidence. Right. So that's not one. Think, not leave anything on the table. Ooh, that's good. Not leave anything on the table. Don't want that bastard getting one dime more than he's entitled to. <laughs> Forgive the gross exaggeration. Yeah. Um, and um, uh, Matt, uh, be aware of taxable impact, tax, taxable impact. Don't, don't make one of the, don't make a major financial mistake. Avoid a major financial mistake. Okay, so some of these are going to be the bullet points we use later right. to overcome objections. Okay, so you're gonna know where, you, we're gonna take a look at what you've got, know what you have so you can negotiate with confidence and, make sure, and know you're not leaving anything on the table. So I'd say that's number one. Um, all right, so tell me about, I gotta know what my options are. Um, knowing what the law is, what the formulas are, so that uh, you can make an independent decision and not just take your husband's word for it. Okay, so, all right. So Dan has another principle called be the wizard. You want to be the wizard that they, the, that they look up to as the seer who knows the secrets. Um, so there are formulas. Formulas and guidelines. Uh, who comes up, what, tell me about a formula. Okay, there's a formula that's utilized for figuring up how much you're gonna get in maintenance. Okay. So there's a 
alimony formula. There's a child support, There's a child support formula if you've got kids. Those are pretty much. Okay, so there are formulas. And who are these formulas created by? Is this New York State? Court. Court. Federal divorce court? Federal and state. So federal and state court, divorce family court. Just state, I'm sorry. State. My, my, my legal counsel. Your legal counsel. It's a good thing you brought him here today. Yeah. Okay. So, so there. didn't introduce anybody. This is Paul Pearson. Paul is my partner in many different ways, uh, wonderful in different ways. And he is this a doesn't. very experienced family law attorney and mediator. Everybody say hi, Paul. Oh, hi, hi, Paul. <laughs> Awesome. All right. So there are the, the state, fam, state family court has specific formulas to determine what alimony and child support you can receive. It's, we'll make sure that you know what all your options are so that you won't be taken advantage, you won't be taken advantage of, ooh, because she's afraid of that. He can't just give you X, he has to go by the rules. He can threaten you into saying, into agreeing to lots of things on pain of that. Okay. Cut you off without assent. Okay. No? Can't do that. Yeah. Okay. All right. Uh, number three, more money. Um, yeah, know how to work with the formulas and around the formulas. Because if you go to mediation, you can agree to a different version of the formulas. There are ways to work the formulas in your favor so that you get more. We can manipulate the system to get you more favorable settlement. Okay, so those. And I try not to talk like an attorney, but it slips in there anyhow. Is this, is this, are you indirectly there women in here? Yes. Okay, so I would rather than manipulate the system, I would say make the system. Work for you. Yeah. I don't not work with men, but more women, but I'm, I, I market to women. Okay, so that's one, two, and three. Okay, so you're going to know, know what you have so you can negotiate with confidence and not leave anything on the table. Sound good? Yes. Awesome. The uh, state family court has formulas designed to determine how much alimony and child support you receive, and you want to, we want to make sure that you're not taken advantage of. Sound good? Yes. Okay. We want to ma make sure that we make the system work for you so that you can get as much money as you're entitled to and get the most favorable s settlement. Fair enough? Yes. Awesome. Getting started is easy. The first step is, what do we, what? Make an appointment with me. Is make an appointment with you. And we'll talk about it. Okay. What is our, what is, we need a sexy name for that appointment. Or do we want to send the book as shock and awe with an appointment confirmation letter along I mean, with some I'm other stuff? I whether she would, instead of going for an appointment, would that be something that you would be doing, like say, can I send you my free book that I've written about divorced women? Okay, so we've got two schools of thought. We've got the send her a book along with a shock and awe box, along with a bunch of stuff in it, and let that sell the consult because no one else is going to send. If she calls anybody else, no one's sending her a book and a shock and awe box. Or we've got go for the appointment. You could send the book and shock and awe, qualify for that. You could call it, sell for the appointment. And if they don't go for it, down sell them and say, okay, why don't I send you my book so that you know what to look for. And then the book does the rest of the work. Before I send them the book, I want to know how Hang on, one, two, three, four. Paul, Bill, Tom. I, w I don't want them going online because if they because then they're in a place where they could just hit back and Google stuff and find other people. So I do I, the website may be the first place where we generate the lead, where they watch the video, get the book, and then call, and then she's converting them from I got the book now I want an appointment. But if they don't go for the appointment, if they don't have the book yet, I would totally downsell them the book. Or if it turns out that it doesn't work and nobody wants an appointment over the to set it, commit over the phone, I would sell the book. And then follow up, sell the appointment. Bill and then Jimmy. I, actually, I was wondering, I didn't know how you got the appointment. I didn't, I didn't know what you'd done to get them to raise their hand. I must have been sleeping or something. 
We didn't. Dis she hasn't. Discuss we didn't discuss it. Oh, okay. You didn't miss it. All right. Well, all right. well that's that's what I was wondering. All these are based on nice. how we came to it, if I'm not mistaken. Right. Well, I'm glad to know you weren't sleeping. <laughs> and, and the reason I said send the book is because I thought you were still going for yeses. So can I send you my my free book? Yes. Yeah. We at this point after those three, after those three, we're closing. We're selling the console for now. We did the three, it's a perfect fit for you. Let me tell you why. One, two, three, here's what's gonna happen. You wanna set up the time for the appointment. They say no, we're gonna then work on what we're gonna use to overcome those objections and get them in the door. All else fails. Then I, I say, okay, why don't I just send you, why don't I send you a copy of my book so that, that I wrote on the topic going from we to me so that you know what questions to ask and stuff going forward. And then when they get the book and everything that comes with it, they're gonna go, oh my God, I gotta hire her anyway. Right. Yes, we could send them if we could send them to go buy the book. Um, thank you. <laughs> Visual aids. Thank you. He's a, he's a very nice man. Um, along the way here, some somehow I need to pre-qualify these people. It's not enough. We didn't ask a money question. Right, exactly. I don't know how much money they have. Yeah, I was going to ask that because I was surprised that one of your three questions you asked about: uh, Are you getting divorced? Are you work concerned? You want some help with that? There wasn't a money question in there. Right. Right, because you don't want someone who wants the 149 quickie divorce who has no money to fight over. I mean, we don't want them to fight, but. Okay, so then let's go back and add a money question and then we'll finish up. So what do you, because she may or may not know all of the money answers. She may not have written a check in 20 years. You never know. Um, so I need, I need a nice way to want to give this turn? ask around. Yes. You know, Okay. What are we talking about dividing? Okay. So what are we talking about So that would be, so we need a softer way into that than how much you got. Um, so that could be something like. What about that question she just said? How much are we dividing? Right. I was going to rephrase. Yeah, no, no, no. I like that. I could say, so that I can do the best job for you. I want to make sure that what I have is appropriate for you. I can't be all things to all people. How much in assets are we talking about dividing? Something as simple as that. Is the, is the first appointment a discovery appointment where it's a free consultation just for the first time? Yes, but my free consultation, I, I, I bill hourly, so my free consultation is like 15 minutes. Okay. So I'm not so, going to do a whole song right. and dance. Right. With right. no money. I, I think that um, it, uh, it was a great gentleman, Russell Brunson, that summer he may or may not know. Yes. Um, Free value, free value, then you ask for money. When you don't offer something for free up front, it doesn't matter about the book or anything like that, you're going to lose out on everything. So just a personal, because I learned quite a bit from him, is I would offer the free 15 minutes. You've got them in there. Always the purpose of an appointment is to book another appointment. Right. There's no other purpose of that. It's not to sell anything. It's let's get to the next appointment. Right. When they come into the office, let's get to the next appointment already set up. And because you don't know if you're going to have to go toward divorce preparation planning or financial planning, because you're also a CFP, right. you want them in that office, and you're going to tell the person, you know, why don't you just drop by with all the paperwork that you currently have in that 15 minutes, have your staff person make a photocopy, send that person on their way, then from there, you're going to send them out a thank you for stopping by with your free book. From that book, then there's going to be the next letter that goes out because you're already having that follow-up appointment already set in that 15 minutes, you're gonna bring them back in, you've already got some of the assets, and you're gonna say, you know what, bring in also this before I figure out how I can best help you. That's a good idea. That's great. Because yeah. then they're already bought in with sharing the information. They've already brought you information, so they are already committed to you. Once you get them into that appointment, it's a lot easier to make them like you. Oh, yeah. We're gonna serve them a warm That's drink. Warm. We're going to have pictures on the wall of people together. We're going to hold their hand. We're, We're going to hold their hand. We're going to have gonna cookies. Wine. We need cookies I, and wine. I have flowers, chocolate, and tissues right now. We just got to add the wine. Yes, empowered women on the walls. People together in our cup is probably a little. Right. Yeah. Women in a, winning a race yeah. together. Yeah. Groups, yeah. Of women. Groups of women. Yeah, winning a race. Winning a race. All right, 
So that's the, so that's the, we're selling the, at this point, we're selling the 15 minute strategy session. And whether or not we send book and shock and all. And whether or not they're getting, so they may have gone into this because they came to one of your seminars, they may have gotten into this because um, of whatever other reason, or they may have gone to the new book funnel, in which case they opted in for the book, and then with the book comes the 15 minute session, and, they're come, and then it may just be scheduling them at that point. Right. So 15 minute, we still need a better, we need something. Empowerment session. 15 minute divorce empowerment or separation empowerment, financial empowerment, because that doesn't say divorce though. 15 minute divorce empowerment strategy session? Divorce may be a little bit strong. I think the word divorce out just empowerment. Yeah. It's empowerment, it's empowerment, whatever. Because they already know they're getting divorced. Financial empowerment strategy session? That's better. That's better. Yeah, positive. Awesome. All right, so we got our first three bullets. We're selling our, our we got our first three bullets of why this consultation is going to be awesome. We're going to do 15 minutes. Um, we're going to go. You're going to bring it. We're going to go over all your documents. We're going to start making, start talking about what we do next to make sure you get X, Y, and Z. Right. Sound good? Awesome. All we need to do to get started is grab your calendar. You know, let's book a time on the calendar, and I'll tell you what documents we need. So, yeah. You really aren't going to go over all the documents. You're going to no. Yes. No, she's collecting all the documents right. so that we can have everything in one place and we can learn and we can figure out where you are so you can negotiate with confidence and not leave anything on the table, blah, 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 blah. And how best I can help you. And how best she can help. Yes. Well, I'm going to say that she's not going to be able to gather the all the cap is under your chair. There's probably some money that the husband, ex-husband to be is hiding or not hasn't disclosed to her. That could be true. We're not, yes, we're gathering some of the documents. Whatever, whatever. there somewhere. We can look for it later. I'm sorry. We'll look after. He's not going to share his mutual fund account that he hasn't shared with you for 20 years. Right. But odds are she'll have a bank statement. She'll have a credit card bill. She'll have something. And she will be looking for something now. Or maybe she hasn't looked for it before. Yeah, go ahead. Are these women, when you meet with them, are they angry? Well, yeah. Okay. Nobody gets divorced because they're passionately in love. Like, I love you, honey. Let's break up. It's all about beating the shit out of each other. And that's one of the things you're trying to eliminate by doing what you're doing. Was that a question or? No, no. Okay, you were. They're, got they're, it. They're angry, but they may, but I don't. I will let people rant for right. a very short period of time. Right. And then we refocus. My what I see as my role is to create a clear, judgment-free space where they can get some information that they need and leave the drama for someplace else. Right. That's for their therapist office. No, yeah. I, I get yeah. that. I just, yeah. The are they angry? Yes, they are angry. They're really angry, but that's not that's not what they're bringing to to me. I understand. Her job is to be the calming, soothing, rational influence to get the best possible outcome. They're also afraid. They're yep. more afraid than anything else. Okay, yeah. All right. Now, but that, none of it, I don't think that language shows up in that piece. That's all. Awesome. You mean you can't read? Yeah. 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 Yeah.
script. Does it make a difference? From there yeah. on in, your script might change. Because either they're offensive, like they're on the yep. lead, or they're defensive, like, oh, i got to cover myself on this, right? I mean, no? Well, I suppose that that's true, but uh, my goal is to help them reach a fair and reasonable and positive settlement, not to skin somebody for whatever they're worth, because it doesn't work. So, yeah. um, yes and no. Okay, does that make sense? Okay. All right, so we went for our first, hey, let's do our 15-minute strategy session. Um, what are some of the reasons why she would say no? Why would she say, I don't want to do it? Um, because you charge a fee and I don't have any money. Okay, if, they charge a, if you charge a fee and they don't have any money, should they be your client? No. Okay. Well, no, not, not necessarily, because they may not have any disposable income, but there may be money in the, in the house that she just doesn't have access to. I can work around that. As long as there's something there somewhere. As long as there's something there somewhere. Okay, so number one reason is they can't, although you're- Can't afford me. Okay. And then we need to determine if they really can't afford right. you or not. If they really can't afford me, then, then oh, well. okay, then buy my book. Right. Or I'll give you my book. Right. Okay, so no money, what else? So they're frozen. Okay. Um, so how have you typically tried to resolve that and get them to move forward? Um, I will talk to them about who their other advisors are. Who's the, you know, do you have an attorney? Have you consulted with somebody? If not, then I have attorneys that I can recommend to them to have a consult with just so that they know where they stand legally. And often that will help them at least move forward so you're trying to make them take some type of step forward so that the momentum gets going in their direction as opposed to being frozen. Right. Either refer them to a therapist or to a, to a professional, to, to an attorney or a mediator. Um, other than that, most of the people who come to see me retain me. So do you know your numbers? Do you know if you see 10 people, how many convert, how many become paying clients? At least seven or eight. Okay. It's a pretty good closing ratio. Okay. Because people don't come to me unless they have that a, a pretty specific need. James' eyes are bugging out of his head. I'm like, it's better than everybody else in the entire world fails. <laughs> well, is that, is that just your gut feeling because you want Or do you track that on like you Excel? You actually track it with numbers. Um, or both. I haven't tracked it specifically, but there, but I, I keep a file on people who have not retained me. And it's really scary. I mean, there's like five people. Either they retain me or we'll work on just on an hourly basis answering questions. Mm. Well, because they pre select. Yeah, I mean, mm -hmm. not it, nobody's walking in off the street. You know, they will have heard about me or researched me or found me on So the it's all warm. Or talked about somebody because what I do is, is rare, which is part of our marketing issue is that it's really hard for me to reach out because it's such a specific, narrow audience. No, most people don't know there's a such thing as a certified divorce financial analyst. That's the biggest issue, is that people don't know that there are folks who do what I do. Yeah, go on. Jimmy and then Dean. I know a divorce attorney that uh, I'm trying to work with right now in California, and uh, one of her strategies where she gets her clients from is from dating websites. Because mm. for the woman now is looking just to talk to somebody else of the opposite sex, and because their husband won't listen to them, so they, they start that approach, or vice versa. The man does that, and that's the best place where you can go. That'd be really interesting to run ads on Match.com and stuff like that. that for, well, not necessarily well, I'm saying I bet you there's date. I bet you there's websites for people. I mean, heck, there's everything from life is short, have an affair. Yeah, there is. <laughs> Ashley Madison, whatever it's called. Um, there's and there's probably divorce dating sites specifically for just people in that process. Right. It's funny, this is a out of, something Dan calls out of category advertising. So when you advertise in a place where no one else in your industry would ever think of going. So for example, um, there's a company in our herd called Gardner's Mattresses in Pennsylvania. And they are one of the most successful mattress retailers. And they don't sell Sealy Posturepedic, they sell $5,000, $10,000, $20,000 mattresses. 
And part of that is they run ads in, for example, in the yellow pages, they wouldn't be in the mattress store section. They'd be in the chiropractic section. Does your back hurt? Maybe it's your bed. Like there's no other mattress retailers advertising in the chiropractic section. They run ads in the nursing home section. They run ads places no one else would think to be. The most extreme example he gave last year of this was a really success, and forgive me if this offends any of you, this is not G-rated, but it was a restaurant delivery, restaurant that delivered, and they were absolutely killing it advertising on porn sites. In their local market, when you were in LA, if you were searching whateverporn.com in LA, their ad would show up, and it was not regular porn, it was more adventurous porn, so their ads were like, would you like a BLT with your BDSM? <laughs> There would be, and this might be a little bit more offensive, but there was a picture of a sub going, you know you want me inside you. <laughs> and their cost, per, their cost for traffic was dirt cheap because the only thing advertised on porn sites is like penis pills, so I've heard. Um, and they were crushing it because no one else in their industry would ever think of advertising on a porn site. I'm distracted by different questions. Yeah, go on. <laughs> That's a great idea. Around the area because Western New York one, psychotherapy. When you go, when you go up to a marriage counseling, one spouse is saying, I'm done. I'm just going to appease this other person. I'm going to run through the motions, but I'm basically checked out. And the other person is trying to call Can I get my food? So that person that's already checked out, they're going to respond to that ad. And some people, right, they're going, one person is usually initiating the therapy. Correct. And one person is as you, getting dragged along. Correct. That could also be the case. Well, but generally, one person is way ahead of the other right. in the process. Where, whether it's an affair or not. Right. Rare, rarely are the two people at, at the same point. Mm -hmm. Right. That would be those fictional, amicable divorces. Emotionally. Right. Yeah. Yeah. One person is going, I'm already out of here, and the other one's going, but let's try. Right. Or, what do you mean? Something's wrong? I didn't know. Well, I mean, in New York, actually anywhere, there is no defense of marriage. If somebody wants a divorce, they're getting it. Unless you're an Orthodox Jew. You can still get divorced, but the tr the, you can't remarry. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, getting a get is a different. Yes. Okay, so we got, she's got no money. We've got, she's frozen. Yes. Although I guarantee you there's also no one specifically going after the Orthodox Jew divorce market. It's probably a lot smaller. <laughs> Rebecca happens to be friends with all of the wives of all of the rabbis in that community from Jewish playgroups and music what's classes. The, and what's the prevalence of divorce? I do not know. I, all of her friends seem to have, they, according to the, their interpretation of our religious text, they're not proponents of birth control and they're not proponents of stopping having children. So like all of her friends have like seven, eight, ten kids. And they're like, you won't give me four. She's popping out a baby again. Every year she's pregnant. I'm like, do you want to be pregnant for the next decade? No. I'm like, well, then shut up. Well, it's, it's, not, that, it's not that it's a negative, it's a positive. Have yes, a it's supposed to be a blessing. Yes, yes, I understand that. They don't have our children. So my sense is that the, the divorce rate there is, is rather low. I would assume it's, part of me would assume it's lower because it's a lot harder to do. I don't know, there's a crazy husband part of me going, if I had 10 kids, I'd be more likely to get divorced because I'd be way more stressed and sleep deprived, but what do I know? Until you think about how much your child support now in the Oh yeah, that would be terrible. Well, and in, but in, the, in those households, they come with a sister and a mother-in-law and an aunt and everybody. Right, everybody lives in one roof and it's a, okay. All right, all right, so anyway, all right, so back to our script. Okay, so we got no money. She might come because she has no money. We have to find out if she really has no money. We might come if she's frozen in fear. She might not show up. Um, what other objections do you get? Well, if it's a cold call, if it's a cold person, if it's not someone who's really, really warm and referral, she doesn't know you, she doesn't trust you. Why should she trust you? Do you get that? Well, I get some people who are kind of just thinking about it. They're just sort of... So procrastinators. 
um, I will tell them that if you, you know, we c I can help you get some clarity about your financial situation so that you can make a better decision as to whether you stay or whether you go. My head always sings that little song. So if you stay, you go. Um, or that if, if you choose to stay, you'll be a better financial partner. So uh, I can I keep it neutral. In that. Okay. But I say if you should, you know, here's your options. If you you should decide to come back and see me, I'll be here. And do you do any type of follow up with them? Um, I will erratically. Erratic. I will. Okay. I will. Um, and also, one of my other issues is that it's a long process. Right. And so I'll have somebody who will work with me intensively for some period of time. And then there's all of this. A big so, gap. So uh, it, like every three months or so, I'll send an email going, so how'd you do it? Just checking in. And this is someone who's worked, who is a client, through the planning process, not the investment side yet. Right. OK. What about um, following up with people who, the five people or whatever who are in your file who flaked, who aren't ready yet? Do we do any, uh, we, sounds like we're not, you said erratic, so we're not dripping on them on a regular basis. No, no. There's no, here's some tips, you know, here's a weekly tip on your divorce. Not, not directly. I, okay. I, I blog and I, and I have, at the moment I'm not, but I have, if I'm reorganizing, but I've sent out emails and key blasts and stuff like that. But no, I have not directed it. Okay. And that's a good thing to do. Yes. And then what about, is there any concern if she's initiating, for example, that he might find out too soon? So could we do something like training them, here's how to sep set up a separate Gmail address that he doesn't know about, so that I can email you and he won't see it? I, I, I do. <laughs> what did I miss? I think it's crossing a slippery slope right there by teaching a woman how to uh, evade the husband. Well, I don't want her to. She, she, she's no longer, but she's no, you're no longer being neutral. If she said, well, I'm unsure, sure. if you were going to be, if you want to be a teacher, how to how to debate the husband, then what she should do when she's unsure, send her to her religious leader if she belongs to any kind of religious affiliation, instead of, you know, sending her to counseling that's not gonna work, you know, because we just looked it up online, only 25% of marriage therapy ever works. So when you're- It's on the internet, it must be true. For failure, or you're sending them in because they're gonna be a future client of yours. Or I'm sending them, there's a much more specialized uh, counseling called discernment therapy or couples in, con in crisis or in conflict where the goal of the counseling is to determine are we gonna stay or are we gonna go? And it's set up for like three sessions and that's very helpful because you don't have one partner dragging along in marriage and family therapy who doesn't really wanna be there. Right. right. So I can't give you legal advice on whether or not you should tell her to have a separate Gmail account. I, I, that already, was just, do, I already do that. Too. Okay, so then I'm off the hook. Right, she's technically, right. yeah, she's working. I just mean to imply that I'm, I'm neutral across the board, but if somebody says, I don't know if I'm gonna stay or I don't know if I'm gonna go, that's when I, I mean, the decision is theirs. I'm only neutral when I'm in a mediation. Bill. I can't, just one good figure. When, when they say to you they, they, they want to think about it, I, I, would, I would encourage you to be able to ask them, so Mary, whatever their name is, so Mary, how long have you been thinking about it? Good question. Gentle, yes. gentle, gentle, mm -hmm. nurture, 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 question. Right. So, so they say that and then, then they start to really, then there's right. something for them to start to feel. And then when they start to say that, all the next words are, so does, so does it make any sense then? Did he set up an exploratory conversation? So you could even put this into a sales funnel right here. You can yeah. put this into a messenger bot where she don't even need to waste her time with that. The mess artificial intelligence will have that conversation. So you you don't even need to waste well, her time. Well, it might with that. be. I I I know where it was, and I, I I think this is something where it's not gonna. It's, you're gonna have to connect with them. Right. I don't know if people can connect. I don't I don't know yeah. if the technology is a bot. Yeah. When I know I'm talking to a bot, I don't talk to a bot. The, the old bots are like that, okay. but what if all of a sudden I came onto your computer screen and I say, hey, you know, how you doing today? Oh, I want to say none of your freaking business. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's Jimmy, you set yourself up when you talk to Bill. It's like, you know, 
like that my dad, and you just filled out your name and email address and your phone number, and you've requested a time to talk to me, if all of a sudden I'm on your screen to talk to you, you're going to say, none of your business? Well, yeah, I would, especially when I was a robot. Jimmy, Billy is not normal. Yeah. No, yeah. I'm, not, no I'm not. But that's the reason, sorry, the question. Right. Yeah. People don't know to ask. Yeah, sure. So, there's two points here. And, and quite frankly, Bill, a, a lot of times I will, I will do that. Okay, good. I will, but, it's, but I, don't, I probably don't do it all the time, and I should. So, so the key takeaways from both of that, I'm going to bridge the gap here, yeah. is Bill's, Mary, how long have you been thinking about it? That's a brilliantly crafted question. You should absolutely use that if you haven't already. And Jimmy's point that some of this copy, some of this conversation could be had automatically is also true. It has to be done in the right way, so she feels she's having a conversation right. with you, but some of the data gathering stuff, that this is all scripted to, for the point of we're doing this over the phone or in person, but Jimmy's point is some of it could be automated, some of the less intense stuff, the intelligence gathering could be done, they will feel like they're having a Facebook chat, for example, with you, and then taken offline to a phone call, I also agree with. I think there's a happy medium between both. The goal is to pass what's called the Turing test, which is the original artificial intelligence test, which if you sat down and had a conversation typing to the computer, the goal of that for the last 40, 50 years was to make it so that no matter what you asked, you didn't know it was a computer. We're finally getting to that point. Yep. We'll do a future session on that, which will be led by somebody and smarter than me. One of the things that we're going to work on is, is with Paul and with Wendy, our, our, our mental health professional partner, is to do like a divorce and that would be an ideal follow-up to somebody who signed up for the webinar. Yep. Hey, did you watch it? Hey, did you see it? Hey, what questions do you have? Hey, where are you in this process? All of that you could totally do yeah. with a bot because she's not crying in her Chardonnay yet. We want her crying to you, but she could talk to the bot. The bot can't give her a Kleenex and flowers and a picture of happy women and a glass of wine. Yet. They want the actual interaction with yeah. the person. Yes. Yeah. Okay, so we got no money, frozen, and a procrastinator. Okay, so the procrastinator, you got Bill's awesome lead-in question of how long you've been thinking about it, which then segues into the objection overcoming I had, which is the I want to think it over objection, which is the why we know you like the, you know you like the idea of getting clarity and all this good stuff. You're busy. It's an emotional time. You're going to think about it, put it on the back burner, and never do. So let's just get it done. So that I already have. Um, frozen applies to the same thing. You've already kind of got it in terms of let's at least do something. Let's take a step so that you get some momentum. And then no money, we've obviously got to clarify if she really has no money or not. Which brings us to wherever my clicker went. Ah, which let's brings us, it. yes, which brings us to let's do it. So Why don't we have, why don't we do a little role play? We've got a little bit of time. So you're going to be you, and we're going to have somebody else play Jane. And you're going to do of this what you remember. I'll put the process up. Let's go back so that we can start to practice a little bit. Who wants to be Jane, our potentially divorcing woman? Did you need to leave early? Uh, I'll manage. Are you sure? Yeah. Okay. Anybody want to play Jane? Very soon. Okay. Okay. All right. Well, then, before we go into this, why don't you then take off so that we're not you're not bump moving in front of the camera right when she's Jane is in tears. Don't worry. You don't have to be able to cry on cue to play Jane. If no one will do it, I'll be Jane. Thank you, I've enjoyed this a lot. Awesome. All right, so then I will be Jane, because nobody volunteered. All right. I'll be gentle. Not yet. Not yet. And I'm always gentle. You're always gentle, right. It's my role to be gentle. Yes. Okay, so I'm being Jane. Um, so let's say, do we want to make this I opted in for the book? 
do we want to, how do you want me to have come in the funnel because it's got, we're going to do it presumably differently than. Um, I, helped, I helped a friend of yours or a friend of a friend of a friend, which is, oh, and now I, I, get, I get people from, sometimes they find me online, which is, I think is amazing. Um, sometimes it's, a, a, more often it's a referral from a therapist or just a friend. Okay, I'll be a friend of a friend. Okay, so I'm so I opted in, and you're calling me. Right, or it's from that seven things. Okay. All right, ring, ring. Hello. Yeah, I'm. I'm just thinking for it because I, I, I know there are so few of those that come through. I don't do this very often. That's why we're practicing because there's about to be a lot more. Okay, so we'll do it both ways. We'll start with what you're used to. Okay, so ring, um, so you answer. Okay. Hi, this is Adrian Grace. Uh, hi, Adrian. My name is Jane, and my friend Barbara told me you helped her a lot in her divorce and told me to call you. Um, great. Thanks for reaching out. So, um, as we automatically go blank. Okay. Um, well, um, so uh, what's going on in your life? Um, what's going on in my life? What is your most common answer? What is the most common answer you get to that? Well, things aren't going well. Uh, either my husband's just serving with divorce, or more likely, I'm kind of thinking that I'm gonna that I want to separate from my husband, and I'm not sure if I can do it. Okay. Um, I'm things aren't working out very well in my marriage. I'm not sure if I should leave or not, or if I'd be okay. So Barbara told me to call you. You've got to qualify me. When, when at this point, when did she say, what did Barbara tell you about? Yeah, because yeah. Barbara should have told yeah. her how much money yeah. she spent on the attorney. Right. <laughs> you can't right. 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 Oh, let her open up. Yeah. In life, I'm fine. It's sitting up here. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, um, um, so uh, what were you, you know, so, so let, me make sure, let me see if I have this correct. So things are not going well, and, and you, you need a little financial clarity in order to be able to decide what you want to do. Yeah, I just want to make, I don't know if I'm going to be okay, if the kids are going to be okay. I want to obviously, before I make any type of big life-changing decision, uh, Barbara said you were really helpful figuring out, helping her figure out her finances. And uh, to be honest, I haven't even paid a bill in the last 10 years. And I think I'm, I'm a mess. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry that you're in that situation, but I can certainly help. Um, I was able to, Barbara and I were able to work well together, and I know that she had a, she had a good outcome. Um, uh, and I'd, I'd be happy to help you um, kind of kind of get a better feel for where you are and what your options are, so that you can make a good decision about where to go. Okay, you got to qualify me. Oh, I forgot about that. Right. You. So you don't need that. I've got an idea I'd like to share with you. You got a minute because I right. called you in this case, right. but you got to qualify me to make sure you're supposed to be talking to me. Right. Um, you wrote them so down. I help, I, help people, I help people make better financial decisions when they're contemplating going through a divorce or if they're in the process. Um, is that where you are right now? I mean, we, nobody's filed yet, but I'm thinking I'm going to have to. Okay. Okay. So, um, I'm a great, consulting with me is a great place to start because I can help you get better control of the information about your finances and about what your options are as you begin to move forward. And we can sit down together and see financially how this might work out for you. Is that what you were looking for? Sure, but you didn't ask, what are my other two qualifying questions? You don't know if I have any money yet. I don't remember what my qualifying questions were. Okay. One thing we didn't talk about, but is a qualifying question, do you, are you aware of what the complete financial situation is in your marriage? I mean, is that something that yeah, I said I haven't paid a bill in 10 years. Right, so you needed to, what, what did you need to find out from them? You needed to find out if they had money, which you need to ask, and that's the most intense question. You found out if I'm getting divorced, um, and you need to ask the middle question. Okay, I would also ask, you know, has, she, no, she just said that her husband, that she's thinking about it, and I'm, 
the, um, no, she said, have kids is probably later. Earlier in that conversation, she also said to me, she was, was that how you did the role play was, and I'm considering, but I, I don't know how to, what, I don't know about my money. I don't know where to pay. Okay, great. So I, can, I, can, I, can help, I can help you, I can help you with that. I can help you understand. I can guide you to what information you're gonna need to get about your financial situation, and then I can help you understand how that's likely to turn out so that you can decide if, if you can be, or we can work out how you can be financially stable as you move into the next phase. And can I ask you, do you have any idea well, when we're looking at dividing assets about what we have to work with? Okay, so then I'll make something. Um, sure, uh, I don't know. Okay, got that. I think, no, I think my husband has a 401k and we've got some investment accounts and 529s for the kids. Um, and there's a checking account we pay bills from, but I don't look, I, I, like I said, I, he pays the bills, I don't pay the bills, I haven't looked at it in a long time. Got it, and, that, and I work with a lot of people who are in that situation. So we can work around that, I can help you determine what information you need to find, and I can help you with how to find it. Um, why don't you come in and let's uh, talk about it. I'd be happy to do a, 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 a brief free consultation. Okay, we gotta sell me my, fi you got a 15 minute financial empowerment strategy session and what's gonna happen and why it's sexy and why I should do it. Um, I, can t I can tell by the way you're answering questions, you're used to, I guess for lack of a better term, it's a, most of them are layups for you. Yeah. You can just go for the, why don't you come in right away and you're just good. So this is, you can use elements of that in this, but this is more are going to be for the new generation of prospects you're getting as we move you from doer to marketer. And some of these people you're gonna have to work more for, but you'll have a whole lot more of them. Yeah. So the point of this format in this formula is to convert all of those new people. So it's awesome that you won today. Um, Great, thank you. You're welcome. All right, so does that make sense? Yes. Okay, so I also think what might work better is what we'll do is we'll take the recording, not only will, after Laura edits it, will we get it to all of you, but then we'll also transcribe it, edit the transcription, and you'll have the transcription in a Word doc you can edit, so you can cut and paste all of this stuff out, because you're trying to remember everything we talked about for the last two hours, and you don't have a script in front of you, and you're trying to remember a role play without, trying to be an actress without a script, which is kind of tricky. And there's only 12 of us in the room watching, so. Right, right, <laughs> also true. Yes. So it's not a, yes, helpful, but not exactly a fair performance condition. Uh, let's see here. So thank you for playing. Thank you. Thank you all. Let's give Adrian a hand. You are welcome.